Well, good morning once again. As always, it's great to be here as the body of Christ and have the opportunity that we now do to open the scriptures together. Um, been looking forward to this summer series for quite some time now, and uh, as we've already said, we'll pick back up on sermon number two of five for the month of June this year. I was thinking back to the ground that we have covered. We began this summer series uh, last summer, in the summer of 2023, where we looked at five different attributes or characteristics of of God, and then we resumed that study last week by studying together God's justice. I was thinking of the four that I've had the privilege now to uh, to do: God's holiness, God's sovereignty, God's justice, and now this morning, God's jealousy. And while those are certainly mountain peak topics and subjects, I thought it has me longing to get back to to a normal study, so to speak. These kind of topical studies are are a lot of work. I feel like in some ways I've studied for 10 sermons this week. Uh, I don't know exactly where to tell you to turn just yet. We'll be a, a lot of different places this morning. I'm thinking your, your mind would maybe go back to the sword drills in Sunday school when you were just a, a youngster. We'll be a lot of different places this morning. So hope and pray that, that you've got your Bibles. That, that's a grand thought, right? Who would think that you need your Bible? At church, but we do here at Grace Bible Church. We need our scriptures to point us to the Lord of the scriptures. But really, as we've said many times up to this point, the heart behind this study is simple, really, because we know that our understanding of God and your thoughts about Him are the most important thing about you. The more that you understand the attributes and the characteristics that collectively define who God is, your life is then impacted, and this understanding, it really shapes every single area of your life. That's something that I think I've become more and more convinced of as life goes on, is that genuine saving faith in Christ, a biblical worldview, it really impacts every single aspect of your life. Last week, we started by looking at God's justice for the month of June, and this morning we'll consider together God's jealousy. God's jealousy. Jealousy is part of God's perfection. It is one of the attributes, really like all of the rest, that makes God God. God Himself claims that an accurate view or understanding of this specific attribute is important to the understanding of who He is. And we know that from God's own lips. When He is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai, that's the first place that I'll ask you to turn with me just for a moment this morning, would be to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We'll begin at the beginning of our Bibles will be a lot of different places this morning, but really we want to survey what all of the Bible has to say about God's jealousy. It's crucial, it's important that you and I as biblical Christians have a firm understanding of what the scriptures have to say about God's jealousy. Follow along as I read here in Exodus 20, here as I just said is, where we find the beginning of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying that, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. And here's the reason. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. A few chapters later, turn over there with me. Exodus 34. 
Exodus 34, when God is speaking to Moses again after he had revealed the Ten Commandments to Moses and what did Moses do with them? He shattered them. But God has been gracious. He was gracious and replaced the first two tablets that the Ten Commandments were inscribed on. And here in Exodus chapter 34, God replaces those. But also, He reminds Moses and the people of Israel about this key attribute that you and I are studying this morning. Exodus 34, look beginning in verse 1. He says this, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself the the two stone tablets like the former ones. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. Verse 4, so he cut out the two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took the two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in your midst, Even though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Verse 10, then God said, behold, I'm going to make a covenant before all your people. I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth nor among any of the nations. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord. For it is a fearful thing I'm going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going or will become a snare in your midst, but rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their Asherim. Verse 14, for you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And friends, I know that was an extended passage, but just as the people of Israel needed to be reminded of the type of God that they serve, so too do you and I need the same reminder this morning. Friends, because God's jealousy is a necessary response, we could say, When there is infidelity in the heart of his people. And if you know anything about your Old Testament. If you know anything about the nation and the people of Israel. It was a continual cycle of infidelity and unfaithfulness to God. And God for no good reason in the nation or people of Israel itself. Only due to his own choice and loving kindness. Met them with grace and long suffering. But his jealousy is a necessary response to that same infidelity in the heart of his people. Now admittedly there are some challenges in our understanding of divine jealousy. I think we could say that about many of the attributes and the characteristics that we have studied thus far. That there are some challenges in our own understanding of it. Because jealousy like some of the other attributes that we have studied... Jealousy itself is something that you and I as humans that we experience and we feel. And really, if we're being honest, that colors our perspective of what what we think it means anyway for God. 
This attribute, along with others, is what theologians like to call uh, anthropopathism. Maybe some of you have heard that term before. Sure, we can understand some aspects of it. That is God's jealousy. There are indeed some similarities between God's jealousy and ours. But, friends, we must realize that we have some limitations. And strive, we need to strive to let God's revelation define our terms for us instead of our fallen human experiences. Because the danger is this, is in misunderstanding and better yet, misrepresenting this attribute or any other that we would study. But friends, we need to comfort ourselves in the fact that God has used this very terminology to define Himself. It's not as if we are laying something upon God that He is not. God says Himself that He is jealous, that His name is jealous. But friends, remember that our theology is a top-down approach. We, we begin with God and that shapes everything below, not vice versa. And because God does truly love His people and He desires their highest, highest good, divine jealousy, it must accompany His love. Because on the other hand, indifference to unfaithfulness and infidelity in our relationship with Him, it would be a sign of neglect from our great God. God, as you know, is holy and He takes sin seriously. Therefore, He has rightly defined Himself as a jealous God. So before we examine the biblical witness of divine jealousy, I think it's appropriate that we... Uh, we give a definition of divine jealousy that hopefully will be helpful. So here's a working definition of divine jealousy, and that is this. God's passionate zeal regarding what He has revealed about Himself being properly understood and thus resulting in appropriate worship of Him. God's passionate zeal regarding what He has revealed about Himself being properly understood, thus resulting in proper worship. Friends, this important attribute, God's jealousy, it deserves your attention this morning. Nothing more in your life is more, uh, more important than what we have before us in the subject matter this morning in God's jealousy. The scriptures has much to say about God's jealousy. And we only have a time for a brief survey this morning. These certainly will not be all of the passages pertaining to the subject. Because God's jealousy is really a, a theme that is woven and intertwined all throughout scripture. In the Older Testament and the Newer. It would be impossible for us to cover all of that in one sitting on a Sunday morning. So this will just be a sampling of what the Scriptures has to say about God's jealousy. But we say this every time as we approach a subject matter like this. We want to approach it very uh, with a sense of sobriety and we want to attempt to do it justice. So may God help us to do that. As we consider what the Bible has to say about divine jealousy, it seems as if God's jealousy... I think it really falls into three different categories. So I want to look at several different passages from each of those three categories. Now these categories are not necessarily original to me, but I want to give them to you because I think that they will be helpful and they will serve as those hooks, if you will, for us to hang a lot of this information on. So these are merely to, to help you in your thinking or to help you in your note-taking this morning. And the first category that I want you to note with me this morning, I would say arguably is the most important. The first category that a lot of the biblical passage that pertain to the jealousy of God would fall into category number one, and that is this that God is jealous for his own glory. God is jealous for his own glory. Now, many passages that we could go to that would rightly fit into this first category. The first that we'll mention is found in an important section in the book of Isaiah. So turn with me there just for a moment. 
Uh, be turning to Isaiah 42, and I'll meet you there in just a few minutes. Isaiah, as you know, records Israel's deliverance from captivity in, ver- in chapters 40 through 48. Isaiah 40 through 48, those eight chapters, Isaiah records Israel's deliverance from captivity. And it's within this section that God compares himself to the other false gods that his people, the people of Israel, were prone to give their allegiance to. God is saying, to whom can you compare me to? And the obvious answer to that question is absolutely no one. Because God is far superior to anything that would compete for the praise of His people. This praise, He says, that He will not share. Isaiah 42, it would help if I would turn there as well. To whom can God be compared? He's above all. Isaiah 42 verse 8. Look there with me. He says this. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. That's it. That's the end of the study. Let's go home and chew on that. Right? According to God's witness of Himself, He is jealous for His own glory. He's saying the spotlight must always be on Him. But it's no secret that we as sinful humanity, that we like to erect gods of our own making and to worship them. And although our gods that we erect, that we set up, they may look a bit different than the people of Israel's, The same thing is going on within our sinful hearts. Because the act of worship is ascribing worth to something. You probably know that that's where the word worship comes from. It's it's worth-ship. We're ascribing worth to something. And in this case, the people of Israel and also what we're prone to do is ascribe worth to things that are not God. God is saying that there is nothing or no one worthy of praise, honor, and glory except Him. Another passage in Isaiah coming at the end of the section that we mentioned earlier. Isaiah 48 verse 11. He says some familiar words. Isaiah 48 verse 11. For my own sake, for my own sake, he repeats that for emphasis, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. The ultimate motivation behind God's action is for His own glory. And He will always act in accordance with that. Whatever action glorifies God the most, that is what God will do. But the problem is that we as sinful humanity, what do we like to do? We like to try to steal the glory that God alone is worthy of. We've established that, that He, God, will not share His glory with anyone else. There's countless examples of this in Scripture. Just one that comes to mind. Herod, King Herod serves as a sobering reminder of how serious God is about His own glory. Turn there with me to your New Testament just a moment. Go to Acts chapter 12. This is what ultimately happens when you try to steal God's glory. We need to learn from the example of Herod and not follow after in his footsteps. Look in Acts chapter 12. Beginning in verse 21, here Herod has organized a feast to honor the Roman emperor Claudius. And in verse 21, 
He says, on an appointed day, it's, that appointed day is the day of the feast that he has organized. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. But you don't see here where Herod attempted to correct the people, did he? Herod had appointed a day for a feast, for a grand celebration. It says he has put on his royal clothes. He has addressed the people and the people are saying the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod was not quick at all to correct the people that he was addressing. Why is that? Because his flesh, it it enjoyed the praise that the people were giving him. He loved the praise. He loved the glory. And what does that self-praise and self-glory result in? Look at the next verse, verse 23. When we have this type of arrogance, verse 23 is the result, and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory, did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. Now I get it, all of this seems extreme. Because in our own minds, we like to think that we would never do this. You and I would never do that. We, we would never put on a royal apparel. We would never assume the seat of the rostrum. You and I wouldn't do that. We, we know better. But friends, uh, again, we do this very same thing when we attempt to steal some of the glory that is due exclusively to God. You may not, in fact, put on your royal garments and assume your throne in that exact same way that Herod did. However, the exact same thing is going on in your heart of hearts when you attempt to steal the glory from God. And we are oftentimes guilty of that very thing. This is why, if you remember at the end of my sermon last week, I alluded to this fact. This is why that it matters that you believe in the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinners. That's why it ultimately matters. Because when you attempt to place a spotlight on yourself, when you try to take some of the credit, remember how God views this heinous sin. That's what you need to remind yourself of when you are tempted in your heart and mind to glory in your own salvation and think as in some minute way that you have contributed to your salvation, that you have saved yourself. As you survey the wondrous cross and you know the gospel story and all that has occurred there and you know the work of our great Savior... And you think as if some way that that wasn't enough to save you. That you still have to help out God in some way. Friend, I'm here to tell you this morning. He does not need your help. Because He will not share His glory with you. And if you could take credit in your salvation. Some of the glory and honor would go to you when you stand before Him. But that's not the case. That's not what the Bible teaches. We need to remember how God views this sin and what He says about salvation itself. How does God save sinners? Just a few quick examples. Just jot these down. You don't have to turn there. The first one very briefly and then a more extended one. The first one, Colossians 1 verse 13. For He, that is God, what did He do? He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. God did that. God did that. I want you to turn with me very quickly. I'll I'll read it for us and just follow along as as I do that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. All three members of the Godhead, all three persons of the Trinity are present here. And we'll see how in the past God the Father planned it in the present God the Son purchased it, and God the Spirit protects it. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, this is the golden chain of salvation, we say. 
Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to the kind intention which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Things in the heaven, heavens and things on the earth. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His own will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is giving as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession." To the praise of whose glory? His glory. We had nothing at all to do with our own redemption. What is the only appropriate response to a passage like that? I think it's Romans eleven thirty three to 36. Oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has became His counselor? Or who has first given it to Him that He might be paid back to Him? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Now, for the sake of time, we have to move on. But there is more that we could say that God is jealous for His own glory. And He has so orchestrated all things, all events of history, and especially the plan of redemption and the plan of salvation, that none of His glory would be shared with anyone else. God has redeemed His people. God has lived the holy life that we couldn't live. He has provided the sacrifice. He has given us the faith to believe in Him. Once we do believe Him, we're kept secure by His Spirit who will ultimately one day glorify us. Therefore, when we stand before Him in glory, in that moment, all praise, all honor, all honor, all glory go to Christ and not us. But not only is God jealous for His own glory... The second category that a host of passages fit into, that's category number two, that God is jealous for the allegiance of His people. God is jealous for the allegiance of His people. We read it earlier, but Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, Or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I the Lord your God am a jealous God. But again here is an area where I think we oftentimes like to give ourselves a free pass. We think we're we're good. We don't don't make idols for ourselves. No, No golden calves or wooden images here. We're good. We don't have to worry about that sin. That may be true. There might not be any golden calves or wooden images, but we don't serve idols in in that way. But friends, make no mistake about it. You and I do have our idols. Oftentimes there are worldly blessings and pursuits that are not bad in and of themselves. But the problem is that we worship them as gods. They receive our ultimate allegiance and loyalty. That is what an idol is in our life. 
That is what a, a God that you have resurrected for yourself is. Is whatever receives your ultimate allegiance and loyalty. What are some good things that are not bad in and of themselves that oftentimes we struggle with in this life? Our families? Our jobs? Our extracurricular activities. I mean, that, those are just three. And those three things are not bad in and of themselves, right? I mean, those are three categories that are present in every single one of our lives. All of us have a family to some extent. All of us either in the past or currently have, have a job outside of the home or in the home. And all of us engage at some level in some sort of extracurricular activity that we like to do. Those three things are three blessings from God that He gives to us, that we take part in, that we enjoy, that we can use to honor and praise Him with. Three important areas and aspects of our life. Yet our problem is, is those three in particular were very prone to serve as idols. We're very prone to make an idol out of our family. I mean, that, that seems kind of counterintuitive. Does it, Jake, how do we make an idol out of our family? It can come in the form of comfort. It can come in the form of time together that we're unwilling to sacrifice anything for the sake of our family that God may call us to. Friends, you should know that if you are going to be faithful to God, your family is going to have to take and make sacrifices. We're prone to make an idol out of our jobs. We're called to provide, right? Men in particular, we know that. We're called to provide. We're called to work. That, that's a good thing. We can use that to honor and glorify the Lord. But you're not to make an idol out of it. It's not to be more important than shepherding your own family. It's not to be more important than eternal matters. Extracurricular activities. Whatever that is for you. All of us like different things. Some of them similar, some of them different. But if your extracurricular activities receive your ultimate allegiance and your ultimate loyalty, that's an idol for you. That's a God for you. If you're ever faced with eternal matters or church functions... And extracurricular activities. If your choice is ever and always. Fill in the blank extracurricular activity. That's your idol. That's what you're serving. I'm not saying there's never a time for that. That there's never a reason to, to miss or go on trips or any of that. That's not what we're saying at all. That's not what we're saying. But if our activities, our, our things that we enjoy, if that's where our loyalty lies, if that's the choice that we always make, that's the God that you're serving. And friends, there are many in the world today that are serving the God of extracurricular. We need to battle that. We need to be engaged there. There are more obvious dangers that compete for our loyalty. Things that we are to abstain from as followers of Christ. We know this from James 4 verses 4 and 5. He says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. One of the ways that Scripture helps us understand this concept of God's jealousy for the loyalty of His people 
is that it's often connected to the concept of marriage, which requires what? What, what does every good, healthy marriage require? It requires a lot of different things, but especially loyalty and exclusivity. And as you and I find this great subject matter in the pages of Scripture, oftentimes God's jealousy is found in the context of marriage. Here are just a a couple examples. Isaiah 62 verse 5, For as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. An example from the New Testament, Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. One more example, Revelation 21, verse 2. Here with an eschatological element to it. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. God's jealousy is tied to the concept of marriage and As the bride of Christ, we are to remain loyal to our bridegroom. As the bride of Christ, there is no room whatsoever for infidelity or unfaithfulness on our part. More that we could say, certainly. But this brings us to the third and the final category this morning that we will consider together. That is category number three, that God is jealous for the exoneration of His people. God is jealous for the exoneration of His people. I loved how one pastor put it this way. And to be honest with you, I'd never thought about it this way. But I was so encouraged by it, and I trust that you will be as well. He said this, quote, that God's jealousy is what will accomplish our glorification. God's jealousy is what will accomplish our glorification. Have you ever thought about it that way? That ultimately, why is it that you and I will remain secure in Christ? Ultimately, why will we live throughout our lives, certainly not perfect, but in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, and then one day will be presented to the bridegroom himself, that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our future glorification is ultimately rooted and grounded in God's jealousy for us. We see this in the Old Testament where God's faithfulness to His people, the nation of Israel, is rooted in His jealousy for His own glory and the vindication of His people. Because He will keep His word. He will honor the covenant promises that He made to them. We don't have time to turn there, but we know this from Ezekiel 36. I encourage you to read that chapter on your own time. But one example that I want to share with you, just one verse from Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2. Let me read it to you. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath, I am jealous for her. God will not abandon the nation and the people of Israel because His jealousy will not allow Him to do so. New Testament counterpart to God's same faithfulness. We know from Philippians 1 verse 6. Paul offers these 
words of encouragement to the saints who are in Philippi. Philippians 1 verse 6, he says, For I'm confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Every genuine believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is secure in Him and will one day be ultimately glorified. Have you ever thought about your eternal security being rooted in God's jealousy for you? Because there's no one more powerful than our God. We, we know this from the lips of our own Savior. John 10, 28. Jesus says this. And I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise be to God that He's jealous for His people. And their security. Because if it was left up to us as fallen humanity, we're we are imperfect. That's, that's not a surprise to you. And if your eternal security depended upon you or, or me, we would be sure to lose it. We would be sure to make a mess of it. But our eternal security is rooted and grounded in the fact that God is a jealous God. And those that He has died for, those that He has redeemed, those that He has brought to Himself, He will not let them go. Praise be to God for that. And if He has granted you saving faith, you can rest assured that He will keep you until final glorification. Because friend, He's jealous for you. So what does all of this mean? I know that we've said a lot, but I think that there are several implications that we can draw from our study of God's jealousy. What does this mean for us today? Very briefly, first, from where we just left off in our last, in our last category, that God's jealousy, I think the first implication that we can draw is God's jealousy should result in our gratitude. We should be grateful that God is not indifferent to us and that He disciplines those who He cares for. If God were not jealous for you, if He did not exhibit a divine jealousy, He could care less when you are in sin. He could care less when you are Walking away from Him. When you are trying to make friends with the world. But the fact that God pursues you. The fact that God disciplines you. The fact that God has shepherds in your life as instruments in His hand. That come alongside you. That counsel you. That point you to the eternal truth of His word. That's a great blessing in your life. And that should result in gratitude. Next, I think that we can rightly say that God's jealousy should encourage our ministry efforts. Because just as the Apostle Paul was provoked to action in Acts 17, as he observed the city of Athens around him being full of idols, so too do we need to be encouraged and reminded to be jealous for God's glory. Because church, I'm afraid... It seems as if we just become so accustomed and used to the sin that we find around us. And we shouldn't be indifferent to it. We shouldn't be indifferent to the state of the world around us. We should be spurred on to further action to take the truth of the gospel to them. Because the fact that we are still here means that God still has a people that He has yet to bring to Himself. And guess what? God's word is sufficient for that work. As you survey the landscape around you, and I'm not even talking out there on the west coast or out there in the big cities. I'm talking right here in Lexington County, South Carolina. Small town USA in the Bible Belt. Eat up with sin. 
Eat up with, with, the, with the mindset and the love of the world. You should be motivated as, act, as Paul was in, in the book of Acts, in Acts 17, as he found himself in, in Athens before he stood before the Areopagus and delivered that great sermon. You should be spurred on and provoked by the same love for God's jealousy that the Apostle Paul was. You don't need to look very far. You, you can look to your next door neighbors. And if you're not moved to action as, as, you, as you consider God's jealousy, as you consider your own jealousy for God's glory, you need to be motivated to action. Yet I'm afraid that we're, we're just very used to all that we see around us. We're very used to every, every year now in the month of June, we, we, we find ourselves being caught in the midst of Pride Month. Where as we said, we, we, we're a society that, that sets aside a whole entire month to, to celebrate a pet sin. And I'll be honest, as the years go by, it, in our own mind and thinking, it just becomes less and less of a big deal to us. We just become more accustomed to it. We just know that that comes around every year. Every June, that's what it's going to be. Shame on us for thinking that way. We need to be spurred on and encouraged to, to further action and to take the gospel to a people that desperately need it. Let us be jealous for God's glory and work until He calls us home. God's jealousy should encourage our ministry efforts. Another implication, God's jealousy necessitates self-examination. Idolatry in particular is what we are told provokes divine jealousy. Therefore, I think we need to take an honest evaluation and see if there are any idols in our lives. And if there is, we need to call them what they are. It would behoove us. It would do all of us well to just be honest with ourselves. Because in all reality, we're the only ones that are fooled. I assure you, God is not fooled. He knows what is and what is not an idol in our life. Yet you and I, we cut ourselves too much slack. If there are idols in our lives, we need to call them idols. Don't rename them. Don't recategorize them. Don't blame shift. Call them idols. Call them gods that we're serving. And go to battle with them. I'm sure there are more implications that we could draw. But that's all that we have time for this morning. And as I said to begin our study together. That God's jealousy is a sobering topic. But friends we should comfort our hearts. Knowing. That God is jealous for His glory and for our good. God's jealousy is not a bad thing. It's not something that we should push back against. That we should be bitter about. God's jealousy is for His glory and ultimately our good. In the throne room of our hearts, there's only room for one God to sit on them. And it's either the one true God of the Bible. And you take him. You take him at his words. And his standards are his standards. And you submit yourself to them. Come what may. It's either the God of the Bible. Or the God of this world. And one of those two is sitting on the throne of your heart. I encourage you to ask yourself this morning. Which one is it? Which one is ruling and reigning in your heart and life? And I pray to God that if the God of this world is sitting on the throne of your heart. That you would honestly evaluate where you stand with him. And trust in him and him alone for your salvation. And be thankful, be grateful. That he is a jealous God. And he will not share his glory with another. Let's pray.
our great God in heaven, whose name is Jealous. Father, we thank you that in all of the characteristics and attributes that define who you are, Father, this morning in particular, we praise you for your jealousy. Lord, just as you were jealous for the hearts and the praise and worship of the nation and the people of Israel in the Old Testament, so too are you jealous for the hearts and the praise of your church today. Lord, we know that we are so prone to ascribe worth to many things that are not you. Oftentimes good things, as we have already stated this morning. So God, we pray that you would give us heavenly wisdom. That you would give us discernment according to your word. To realize what is receiving our ultimate allegiance and loyalty. Father, we pray that you would make us a people that is known for our fidelity to you and to your word. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to live by the conviction that you are true and every man is a liar. Father, make us a people that always and ever place a spotlight upon you and don't attempt to rob you of the glory that is due to your name. Father we know that you exhibit perfect justice. We know that you display divine jealousy. And Father for that we are thankful. Lord we pray that you would bring those to yourself. This Lord's day morning. That have yet to trust in you. That are still serving the God of this world. And are still following after the lust and the desires of their own heart. We pray that they would look to you today for salvation. And trust in you and you alone. And Father for those that have identified with you. We comfort our hearts in the fact that you are jealous for them. And as we have stated their eternal security is grounded in your divine jealousy. Father, discipline us where we need to be disciplined. Correct our thinking where it needs to be corrected. Show us the sin in our own life. And may we praise you for your jealousy this morning. We ask all of this in our Savior's name. Amen.